Father, we pray you would really lead us in prayers as a praying church. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And in our private life, personal life, prayer. And sometimes we do not have because we do not ask. And we want you to lead us in the spirit of prayer in these days. We want our neighbors to be loved and find the reality of Christ. We want our, our country uh, to, as it is to, that some would turn the corner and make big decisions in trusting you and setting you before their face. God, we pray that our, our church and all churches everywhere, Lord, you would lead us by your spirit in prayer, in faith, and in love, and change things. Bless Baltimore City. We have needs, we have people crying out and the prophets of the age, the, the leaders of the time, find false causes and lying vanities and causes of banishment. And But there must be one more voice, God, one voice from you, one more prophet, one more messenger. Is there one more? And he will tell us the truth. And that's what we pray for. All over the world, there would be the messengers that come and are anointed with fire, baptized not with water alone, but baptized with fire. We ask it in your name. Thank you for this congregation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> we have a text here that we're going to go through verse by verse. We last week spoke about public worship. Does anybody remember it? And generally, how about one vague impression you remember? Okay, one. How about any detail? Okay. Did you remember, were you here last Sunday? <laughs> Do you remember that, that you sat here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We said, because we are born again, we have the Spirit of God, and we come in Christ's name, and we have a ministry. God gave us a ministry. In that ministry, we have the word, we have prayer, we have reading the word, we have praise, singing, we have baptism, communion, and we also have our offering. Behind it all, most importantly, is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we read in Matthew three eleven, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but someone coming after me, one coming after me, will baptize you with fire. With the, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Because God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Fire is uh, powerful. Fire purifies and cleanses. We are human beings, but we have in us a human spirit. We have our body, behind our body, our personality, our intelligence, emotions, our will. And then in, in the core, we have our heart and spirit. They go together. When you are born again, you have a new heart and a new spirit. Whose heart is given to you? 
Jesus' heart. Whose heart? David had a heart after God. That heart after God came from God. And in our new birth, we kind of like suddenly, like a curtain, you know, like this, there's a curtain and then you kind of see it. And then if you can, like, just get beyond it and see, really see. We said recently that at the Last Supper, Jesus had his disciples and it was a question, remember? Remember the conversation? There was Philip there, there was Thomas, there was Nathaniel. And Nathaniel said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you haven't seen me? And don't you know that if you really see me, it's like this, then you have seen the Father. So this morning in our message, we're going to look at these verses and speak about Abraham and the altar that Abraham had and his nephew, Lot. I'll change the the altar Abraham had and his nephew, Lot, who had no altar in the story of Genesis 19. And if you are reading your Bible, I'm sure you will enjoy this. Pastor Dan Lysby told me the other night, Pastor Dan, you read the Bible once through every year, right? And how many years have you done that? About five years. Every year he reads right through the whole Bible. Isn't that awesome? Um, if you read Genesis 19, Lot had no altar in his life. Yeah. Linda down here said, that's sad. Abraham had one. And... and um, so we're going to go in that direction. We're going to say something about this in a few minutes, but we'll start here in Hebrews 6 and look at verse um, 12 and read to verse 20 and make comment as we go along. And I am believing your heart will be stirred in faith in seeing the big picture and seeing what is really going on in life, okay? That's what I want to say this morning to you. Um, there's, there's an amazing ability that you have to see beyond the scene. We see what we see, and then we're able to see beyond what we see, and we need that. We actually need it. Now watch and read it with me. Verse 12. That you be not, would you read it with me? One, two, three. That you be not slothful. Okay, let's pick it up. That you be not slothful. Let's go loud. Listen, if you read it loudly, you'll enjoy it more. And you might wake yourself up too. Ready? Verse 12. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. No, let's act. Uh, I'm slothful. Okay. Um, I have promises, but they don't mean much to me. I have uh, the Bible, but I'm not really reading it. I, uh, I'm a believer, but it really doesn't, it's kind of a little bit on the shallow end of things. Doesn't mean so much to me. But through faith and patience, you plod along, you go by faith, and there's patience, and faith, and patience, you persevere, you, you have God, God is with you in it, we'll see it in a minute here, verse 13, ready, for when God, loudly again, for when God made promise to Abraham, 
because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. I swear in the name of Inigo Montoya. I swear on the grave of my father, Inigo Montoya. Okay? I swear on... How else do we swear? We swear in the name of God. We swear in the temple. They, they swear by the temple. They swear by... Uh, they, they, they will get you. They, swear, they make contracts and deals and agreements. And people swear by... How? Swear by a higher authority. The police are going to get you. The United States government is after you. The FBI, the CIA... I swear by a higher authority, right? But because nobody is higher than God, then God would not swear by anybody but by himself. On the basis of my nature and my character, on the basis of my all-knowing wisdom and knowledge, on the basis of my love and my integrity, on the basis of me, I swear to Abraham. And what did he say to him? There's two things here. In Genesis 12, 3, I don't want to go into it in, in detail, but generally I'm, you will understand what I'm saying because this is true. I'll tell you the big what happened. Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. If I'm going to be the father of a great nation, I need a son. And I'm 75 years old. And my wife is uh, about 10 years younger than me. And she can't have children. Now he is 199 years old and his wife is impregnated. She is pregnant with a child at the age of 90. At the age of 90, this old woman has a child. This is the, I promise you, Abraham. But in the process, you don't see it for 25 years. But he's plodding along in faith and patience, believing that what God has promised, he's able to fulfill. And we are followers of Abraham because Way back in our Bible, we have an amazing story about this man who really has no, he's a nomad. He really doesn't have much of a family. He has a nephew, he has a few people. His father passes in Tara. Um, he's now in the promised land. He's a small group of people with some camels and sheep, and he has silver and gold, by the way, and actually becomes, in one sense, he's... He is wealthy, he says that he is rich, he becomes rich, but he doesn't have a huge army, political power, nor property. This is the second thing. God said to Abraham, you will have the land. This land is the size of Delaware, state of Delaware, small spit of land in the Middle East. God is saying to Abraham, this is yours. Now, if you go back to that day when the Aborigine peoples were in that territory, they were called Canaanites and Hittites, Jebusites and Perizzites, different groups of people and tribes that were, were spotted in territories and they had their ancient world and there's one man there that would be spoken about 4,000 years later, right in Baltimore City, and we'd be saying, that guy, that's the guy. That's the guy. His name is Abraham. And it's going to be sure. He's going to be the father of a great nation. I mean, and we haven't yet seen what Israel will mean in the future coming of the kingdom with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ where he will be situated right there in the city of Jerusalem, and the kingdom of God will emanate out from the city of Jerusalem, covering the world as we know it today, geographically, the Philippines and Japan and the islands in the Caribbean and the continents 
of South America and Africa and Australia, the world as we know it will be actually under the influence of a government that we can hardly understand that this government with executive powers, judicial powers, legislative powers, that Christ's kingdom comes on earth and he rules here with a real government. And he promised Abraham that it would be centered on him and his people. But the halting steps, the not seeing his son, not owning the land with money and having territory. His only property when Abraham died, the only property that he legally owned was the grave that his wife was buried in. Nothing else. He had no paper or document. He had no right or title to any of it except he did because God had given it to him. But he had no papers on it. Is this your land? Yeah. Well, you don't own anything, buddy. Pal, hit the road. And Abraham's in the land, and he can say in his heart to the Canaanites, guys, you're the, you're the inhabitants here, but there's something bigger going on. And it's for real. And Jesus said the same to us. Blessed are the meek they will inherit the earth. Now we don't see that very clearly at all. We see the world governed by, generally speaking, unbelievers, and Gentile nations that are like fierce, powerful uh, animals in the book of Daniel, fierce uh, beasts, they're called, in the book of Revelation. Fierce military powers, steel and, and teeth, and fierce powers that are running the world today. And we see it in our history. Of course we do. There's a gentle Savior, a lamb that t takes away the sins of the world that is saying, I am the Christ. I am the the Savior, I am the anchor for your soul. Let's read it. It says to Abraham, verse, God said, made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Verse 14, saying, surely blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. Where are the original inhabitants of the promised land today. Where are those tribes? I cannot find a passport that says Canaanite in it. Is there a Canaanite passport? No, but there is an Israeli passport. Is there a Jebusite passport? No, or a Hittite passport? No, what, but there is an Israeli passport. What happened? I will multiply you, you small little group, the three, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. And Isaac had the same problem having children. He had the same problem. And it's all in the plan that God will say, it'll be, you will stumble. And at times you will not believe me. But I promise, and I could not ever promise by anybody higher, there is none. But I promise by my own integrity, my own power, my own way, and my own plan, that it will happen. And here we are 4,000 years later looking at the Jewish people, actually in amazement. In amazement. For 2,000 years, they're underground, so to speak. The Hebrew language is the only re language resuscitated and kept only in the synagogues in Russia and around the world, these rabbis that kept Hebrew. But nobody was speaking Hebrew. But there are certain few groups of Jewish people around the world. And when they went back to Israel, they reinstituted Hebrew, and now Hebrew is spoken in Israel 
as their language. It'd be like us speaking Latin, going back to Latin or some other language. Latin is dead. Hebrew is not. Israel is dead. No, it is not. They are coming back. The Jews are coming. And Jesus Christ came to make us the sons of Abraham, not by our, by our um, DNA, but by our spiritual birth, by, by God, sons of God. And how are we sure? Look at, read it, making the parallel. Verse um, 15, so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Look up at our screen. After he got the son, and he also got the land, walking in it in Genesis 13, we'll read that a little bit later. Verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater in an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. That means, as I said, we swear by a greater authority. We, get, we go to the police department and get a, uh, a warrant, or they, they get a warrant, or the judge gets a warrant, however it works. And, or we get um, a document that is the power behind the document is higher than us. And this happens in the affairs of men. But we have found that there is no one higher, that we have based our life on the highest. There is not a government in the world that could give to us what we have. Nobody could make these promises. Nobody could give the guarantee. No one but God himself. And because he cannot swear by any greater, he swore by himself. Verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Immutability of counsel means unchangeable counsel. It's almost, if you could imagine, God going into a room with himself and uh, making an agreement that simply cannot change. He comes out of the room and he makes the promise. And we say, I don't see that happening. I don't see how that could happen. I don't know about this. And God is saying, I have an immutable counsel in myself. And this is the guarantee that the Father and the Son have agreed the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, the three in the Trinity have a council. It's called in Acts 2.37, um, 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 <laughs> what is that? Sorry. The determinate council, thank you. The, de the determinate council. And so this, this is the main argument in the text here, that Abraham, even in a, in a world where he could easily say, this isn't going to happen. I'm a nobody. I don't own the land. I don't have a son. This isn't going to happen. And the emphasis is, is on God making this agreement and that Abraham, he's stumbling and falling down and has his doubts and his questions, but then he bounces back and he, he builds an altar. And we'll look at that in a minute and see what that means. Builds an altar and he's able to see and in faith he is believing beyond what is seen. And this is often how we live. 
We live most of the t many, many times only based on our own perception, what we see and how we feel and how we relate to what is happening. And the Lord is wanting to teach us a lesson this morning. That there's, an, there's, there's another way, there's a way of seeing and living, and it is, in, you know, the, the, we say it often, it's, it's like, could I see, Lord, really? What, is, what this really is about, what is really happening? Lead me in it, show me, baptize me with fire, not only water, but baptize me with fire, and allow me and show me, help me, because I have a gravitational pull to the dust. It says, my soul cleaves to the dust, but quicken me according to your word. The gravitational pull to the natural life and the attachments to the world. Okay. Then go to the text again. Verse 18. That by two immutable things, the sun and the land, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. What does that mean? Because we see Abraham getting this and it happening, so we reading the story would be greatly encouraged and have consolation, be also comforted by that which we kind of struggle with also. We would be encouraged in our faith and in patience, inherit the promises, get a hold of them and know them. Personally, because my life must be bigger than my children. My life must be bigger than my job. Lot had no altar, but he went to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he lingered when the angel said, it's time to go. It said he lingered. It means he, he couldn't get out of there on, on a, in a timely way. He was kind of stubbornly hanging out. And he even told his sons-in-law, we got to get out of here, we got to get out of here in the previous verse. But when the angel said to him, now it's time to go, he lingered because he felt comfortable there. And I want, I want you to say, life has to be bigger than my own health, Life has to be bigger than my wife and me. Life has to be bigger than my children, my possessions, my very life. My life has to be bigger than my very life. You know, I read something from C.S. Lewis that the way he worded this, talking about, and this is from Screw Tape Letter, Letters. One demon is talking to another demon, and he's talking about middle-aged people, the long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather, the demon is saying to the younger demon. You see, it's hard for these creatures to persevere the routine of adversity, the de gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair of ever overcoming the chronic temptations, which we have again and again defeated them in, the drabness which we create in their lives, and the inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it all. You know, they resent, we, re we resent, like the middle-aged, the dull, the kind of monotonous, you know, and, and in our hearts. There are things about Lot in this uh, story that somehow, uh, let's, let's make it different here. 
in Sodom and Gomorrah um, that are like us, because he is a believer. Lot is a believer, but he's not baptized with fire. Lot is a believer, but he's not going anywhere. He's very settled there. He's attached. Lot is a believer, but there's what, what's going on in his life with God. We don't see much there. And this is the part I wanted. We, in our middle age years, we may prove prosperous. Our positions may be stronger. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding its place in him. He has increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing and agreeable work build up in him a sense of being really at home in earth, which is just what we want. So, what, what, we, what I'm saying, what I want to say, I want the Holy Spirit to say to us, is, um, I am here, but can I be, can I leave? Can I die? Can I leave my family? Can I leave my church? Can I leave my job? Can I leave my, can I leave here? And the answer is no, I'm okay, God, I want to be here. This is my place. And uh, this is my home. And, and this is the, uh, this is what, this is the real freedom is, is that even, you know, it is the Lord is before our face. We have an altar. And we put on the altar our favorite things. We put on the altar our life. We put on the altar our possessions. We put on the altar the bad stuff and the good stuff. We put on the altar, and in doing this, we're able to see and understand that our life is bigger than just simply this life. Um, another, th another thought on this that I... We, came to my mind this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 3, which is a startle, startling, turn there with me, startling fear, <clears throat> referring to counsel with godly women. Godly women, there are many of them here in our church, I, I see amazing faith and love, wisdom, prayer, the ministry, women's ministry, um, serving quietly, uh, bringing food to people's homes and loving, counsel, advice. Good, godly women are amazing. And here it says, they have a meek and quiet spirit in chapter 3, verse 4. The, uh, the beauty is internal. There is the adorning of the hair and the putting on of nice clothes, and that's mentioned in verse 3. But then there is that, that other beauty that is of a meek and quiet spirit, and that's verse 4, which in the sight of God is of great price. But how could a nervous woman and or a man easily upset maybe on the edge, maybe living emotionally on the edge of some crisis. He's afraid of some collapse. Maybe, how, how can we actually have this quietness? And it's mentioned here, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, holy women also who trusted God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, like Sarah was with Abraham. 
even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. You are the daughters of Sarah, women. You are her daughters in the sense that you also have a quiet and meek spirit, and you're submitted to your husbands in wisdom as it is fitting in the Lord, in God's love, in the inner beauty of your heart. But then it says, I might be, you, you may be afraid with amazement in verse 6. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. This word amazement in the Greek is uh, terror or fear. It's used in our Hebrew Proverbs 3.25. There's a fear of evil. A woman can do very well, then suddenly panic, afraid, frightened, worried, troubled, amazed. I mean, I mean, almost terrorized by the news or by some bad news or by something that happened and worried and troubled. Of course, because... We are made like this because we are prone to trouble. Job 5, 7, a man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upwards. Just as sure as the sparks go up, man has trouble in his life. But what is the answer for this? This goes back to Hebrews Six and it says this, listen, who have, verse 18, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to take hold upon the hope set before us. We have a refuge. We lay hold of the hope which is an anchor, verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I think I'll pause here for a minute just to emphasize. It's a lot maybe that we're kind of swallowing or digesting. We'll look, make a picture here. Here's a ship in the sea, and there's an anchor. Anchor goes by down to the bottom of the sea here. The ship is in a storm, trouble. Or um, I'm in Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm established there, and I don't want anything to change. And this is my home. This is where I live. And don't upset my world, my life. This is where I live. But then the, the st waters start to move. And there's the uh, um, ship is moving. And there is an anchor that is needed. In verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What is the hope here? Okay. Lord, you said Abraham and the two things, the son and the land, were promised, and you gave them to him even when he wasn't sure about it, and even when it didn't seem like it could be, and even when he was a minority, and even when he's walking through the land and he sees the Canaanite villages there and the Hittite villages there, but in his heart he is saying, this is mine. And you are saying to me that I live in this world also. And that I have to get beyond my, my troubled world 
And my, my politics and money and my health and even my own life and see and have an anchor for my soul. And the Lord is saying, yeah, you need, and it goes this way, the anchor for this soul, it goes the other direction because the anchor is in heaven within the veil. It is through the veil. Let's read that. Verse 19. Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. What's the anchor? Jesus is the anchor for our soul. Where is he? He's there. Where's the ship? Here. Here's the ship where I have that sudden terror or surprise. I didn't know that would happen to me. How could that happen to me? I am a Christian. How could that happen to me? I've been praying. How could that happen to me? I, I'm a man of faith. How could that happen to me? And Jesus is saying, come on. Come on. Do you have an altar? An altar like Abraham. An altar. He had an altar. Let's, what, it was an alt, what is an altar? It's a pile of rocks. It, it, that's all that it was. Because in the law of Moses who came after Abraham, but the idea is the same, it is this. Do not build me an altar of cut brick or stone hewn out like in squares and formally, like you would buy at Home Depot, like the overlapping blocks or bricks to build a wall. I, don't make me an altar like that. Nothing cut. Nothing caught and not exalted or high. If you, if you walk up to the altar, the, the, you could be seen under your skirt that somebody could see your nakedness. That's in Exodus chapter 20. So you, your altar can't be high. It must be like just just simple pile of rocks. And it's your heart when you're saying, I, the God you cannot see, I am the God you worship. And I cover your nakedness. I don't want people to see your nakedness. I am your covering. I love you. I am the one that is for you. And I don't want the altar to be so sophisticated looking that people end up worshiping the building instead of finding me. And I want you to have an altar in your backyard under the tree or uh, some dumpy sidewalk I have in my mind uh, in Europe in a, a dumpy sidewalk when I had nothing going on. I'm sitting there on a street somewhere. You know, I have many of them in my life, and I'm sure, sure you do also. And I, I'm there saying, God, this is about you. And I'm sitting here in a street corner, and nobody knows what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm hardly believing it myself, but you sent me here, and we have a message. And we're getting beyond, and, and there's an altar that you have under some tree or on a cliff overlooking a beautiful view or in a dumpy ghetto somewhere where you have nothing at all, but you have in your heart, you have an altar there. And you say, Jesus, this is about you. You promised me. You are my consolation. You are the anchor for my movable boat that can be tossed. Even my boat that gets so locked in that I'm, I'm good, God. I haven't thought of you for a couple of months or weeks or years. I'm good, God. I love, love life. Man, you, I got the good life. Yeah, on the back of the Jeep, you know, the good life on the tire, the spare tire. <clears throat> Okay, is that what you want? You want just to have a, a good life like Lot did? And Lot lingered when it was time to move. And there are some believers, they're not ready to die. And the reason they're not ready to die and move on is because they don't have an altar. 
But if you got an altar, then it's all there, God. It's all your timetable. It's your way because my life is bigger than this world. And didn't Jesus say that? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is a bunch of hamburgers and bills from BGNE anyway? That's all you have when you live another 20 years. More of the same. Psalm 90. And I'm not advocating shortness of life, but I am advocating detachment from a world that God has not called me to be permanently attached to in that way. But he's called me to get out when it's time to get out and leave Sodom and Gomorrah and don't linger here because you're to have a spiritual attachment with me. And when it's time for us to leave the fishing boats, we can leave the fishing boat. When it's time to leave mom and dad, and we can leave mom and dad, not because of our, our lostness, but because of our guidance with God, right? Okay, Let, let's read that verse 20 with me to finish the Hebrews 6, 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, he's the anchor of our soul, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is mentioned in the next chapter, taught about from Psalm 110. Melchizedek had no beginning of days, nor end of life. Mel Mel there's no grave in the world with, a, with a, tight the name Melchizedek, and there's no beginning birth date and no dash. The d life is a dash, and then the end. There's no grave like that. There is not, because Mel Melchizedek was never found. Melchizedek never knew his mother or father, never had a genealogy. Melchizedek is the mystery man. And it's very likely that he was Jesus Christ himself that came and met Abraham when he came from the slaughter of the kings. Abraham worshipped Melchizedek as his priest. And Melchizedek gave him bread and wine. Sound familiar? Melchizedek gave him bread and wine and promised him that he would be a great king, that Abraham was the man. But of course, we know that um, it, we are like Abraham because Jesus, as our priest, the same priest, has honored us with the bread and the wine of communion and fellowship with God in the bigger world. And listen, I'll finish up and make this short. Isn't it amazing Abraham could be walking with his camels in the promised land? And it said that he walked in the, wet, the breadth and length and the depth of them. Sorry, the length and the depth, the, the breadth of them. <clears throat> Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it. I will give it unto you. In verse 17. And this was after he and Lot separated. And he said to Lot, you go that way, I'll go that way. If you go that way, I'll go that way. And you know why he said it? It'd be like this, because actually I own the whole thing anyway. <laughs> you see that? Well, I, whatever you want. You want to go there, you go, go ahead. I'll go over there. Don't worry. I'm, you know what it means? When I give somebody that kind of privilege, who's in charge? I am bigger than the land. You go there, that's fine. Take all you want. I have the power to serve you. I have the power to give to you because actually I got the whole thing anyway. And by the way, my little boy Isaac over there, that little boy, I got him when I was 100 years old. Do you think I have any doubt about this land being mine? Do you think I have any doubt that I have a, the birth of a dynasty that will affect human history, and we are 4,000 years down the road, and Christ came, the son of David, and through him we Gentiles are born into the kingdom, and blessed are us, for we shall inherit the earth. And do you think that we can walk around here and just say to the world, you know, guys, have, you, have a good time, because it's just a matter of time. We're in charge. We got it. 
I mean, just a minute. I mean, I want. I can't believe that you would not believe in Jesus Christ. I can't believe that you would not humble yourself before Him and trust Him. I don't believe that you could not. You wouldn't want to take refuge in an anchor that is in heaven, immovable for us ships that are moving on the troubled seas of life. I, I cannot believe that you wouldn't want to find refuge after the dumpy, empty cocktail party with, with your fears and depression and empty social niceties and mutual admiration and pleasantries that are as phony as a $2 bill. And you know it in your heart, and so do I. And I'm looking for deeper water, deeper food, a more satisfying purpose. And God says, build me an altar. I will meet you. I will promise to you. I will fellowship with you. And I will guarantee it to you. And you will be filled and satisfied. And then you kind of go like this. <clears throat> you know, you say... To the guys in the casino, like in Las Vegas, maybe you say, guys, give it your best shot. But actually, I own everything. <laughs> I got it all. They go, yeah, yeah well, you know, you're crazy. It's like, well, that's what they thought about Abraham. But 4,000 years later, we're talking about him. Yeah. And God's son came through him. And God has an unfolding plan. And I am sorry for you. If you could be so established and so settled in Sodom and Gomorrah and not, not know it's time to get out and get deeper and find something that'll be lasting and permanent and powerful, please come. And then lastly, we should go to the graveyard, the cemetery, and just walk through there with this kind of spirit. Not a problem. Not a problem. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? What's going on here? Don't you know that I have an anchor for my soul, the risen Jesus, who is in heaven on my behalf? And don't you know that my soul is anchored to him so that I might know that death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? And Jesus said, he that believes in me shall not taste of death. But we will leave our body. We'll be out of our body before our feet are cold. And it'll be written in the paper in the obituary that D.L. Moody is dead. And D.L. Moody said, don't you believe a word of it. Don't you believe a word of it. He is not dead. He lives. And how do we know it? We got an anchor for the soul. We need it. We need the Bible to speak. We need the spirit to minister. We need the baptism of fire. And that fire, wow. I mean, that's what every believer needs. And let's, let's make this admission. I don't always have it, but I can get it. I don't always have the, the fire in my heart. I get weary like everybody. I get troubled. I get confused. I get discouraged. I suddenly am like, like um, the, the women in 1 Peter 3 says, uh, if you're not, a, you're, you're not um, taken suddenly by fear, and we all know how that can happen because we're people, of course, that can happen. But somehow, eventually, it might take time, and God's great grace will do it, and he will help us and lead us, but we will land on our feet we will land, we will might somersault a few times, and we might have some tough, tough uh, times. But we have great consolation that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is our God. And he will care for us, lead us, and show us. And have an altar in your life. Bring an altar, and this is where we'll finish up here. When I sometimes when I would travel abroad, I come back home. I walk out in the backyard for a few minutes, and kneel down, or you know, just somewhere, and just say, "Thank you, God. You brought, brought me there, and you brought me back. Thank you, God." 
One time I thought of putting a two by four in the ground and just writing every date when that happened on the two by four as a little bit of like an altar of all the many times what God does and how he takes care. And I, I'm happy I never did that, but I do, I do like it, and I think you want to do this too in your life. Bring it to him. Everything. Everything, bring it to him. Put him between you and your life. Put him between him, you and your failure. Put him between you and your wife. Put him between you and your future and him, you, him between you and your past. Have an altar. And then he'll show you the big picture. And he'll, 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 you'll see and walk in the land and you just say, you know, Canaanites, the day is coming. My people, God's kingdom, I can't see it, but I see it somehow. And I look for a city whose builder and maker is God. And it will be coming here. And I may be gone, but it will be coming. Guys, I know who God is and what he did. He gave me a son, and he gave me the land, and it's guaranteed. How much more we, when we have that story as a reference, have our trust in him, the anchor of our soul. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> Would you pray with me, please? If you're here today and you do not have Jesus Christ in your life, it's your decision. God honors you and respects you and your free will, but he also calls out to you. With all his heart, gives you his son, and he says, please come to me, believe me. Just as you are right where you are, just believe in me. That's what he says. Believe in me personally. And say this, please. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I trust you as my Savior. And then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so the ushers could give you a booklet. And it will help you in your walk. Anyone at all, raise your hand, please, this morning. Anyone? Put up your hand, anyone at all. Anyone over on the left, the back, the right, anyone at all. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Oliver. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>